Okay. Okay, everybody, welcome to another edition of the Roundtable. Pull up a chair. We're inviting you to join us. We've got a great episode today. And as usual, we're asking for your help. We want to start conversations. We want to help. We want to get this out there. So if you're watching this on YouTube or you're watching this on Facebook or whatever platform, please share. Please tell your friends and uh, subscribe. Hit the like button. Do all that good stuff so that we can have one big happy family around the table. So today's episode, we're going to be covering a sensitive topic. And we're asking for your grace as we set it up. And as you're watching Facebook Live and you have questions, please feel uh, free to type it in or, uh, or leave a comment below if you're, if you're doing it on YouTube. And we're going to try and get those answered as well. So today's topic is the restoration. And we're going to say the restoration of gifts and the restoration of offices. We're going to be looking at, in particular, the concept in, uh, in modern terms when somebody says in the charismatic Pentecostal movement that in the last 150 years, 50 years, 25 years, that God is restoring the office of, and it's usually of, say, the prophet or the apostle. Or in the last 100 years, they said things like God's restoring the gift of tongues or restoring the gift of healing. And so as we're setting this up, um, what I want to make sure we're clear about is that well-meaning people, good people who love the Lord, what they're talking about is primarily function. They see the function of the office of apostle or the function of the office of prophet, or they see the function of the gift of healing or tongues. And so they're recognizing that function and praise God for recognizing that function. But when they say it's being restored, um, it connotates or there's a presuppositional idea that it's gone, it, 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 it left. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. Is that a true statement? And as if you've been watching before, what we do is we look at outside, perspective, outside perspectives and uh, historically, is, is, is that a true statement? Uh, historically, and is that a true statement of, um, of someone from an outside perspective? So Pastor Darrell, let's open it up and, and let's talk, we were, again, we're affirming that people are recognizing function, but is it true that God is restoring the office of, say, the apostle? You're trying to set me up with my friends, aren't you? <laughs> do you, <laughs> so you could be the bad guy here? Is that what we're trying to do? That's what it sounds like. That's what it sounds like. Um, you know, I'm going to say, I'll, I'll say it like this. Some years ago, 20 years ago, uh, a friend of mine, a friend of ours, by the way, uh, we, he and I were kicking around the fivefold ministry um, as it was being extolled by a number of, of leaders at the time and uh, took a pretty strong stand, at least amongst the few people that we knew about that. And we thought we were saying one thing, and we didn't know that the people that we were listening to were saying another, and we didn't know that the people we were talking to were hearing another. So let me make that. So all that to say, the phrase apostle and apostolic has such a um, loose definition, really, that, you know, people are, are making it mean things that it hasn't meant and trying to redefine it. So if you say, if you ask the question, uh, is the apostolic office or function being restored? Uh, well, what is it? And, and did it go away? So if, if you say the apostles and you're talking about the 12, well, those aren't repeated. There's an eyewitness quality, quality to that. They can't be replicated anywhere else or brought around in, the, you know, in any other way because nobody else can be an eyewitness. But are you talking about missionaries? Are you talking about church planters? Are you talking about church governmental leaders? I mean, um, I guess I kind of kicked the question back to say, what are we talking about? If we're going to talk historically, um, the church has been confessing the creed since the creeds were being confessed, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 
So there's been the statement that the church is apostolic herself. And what is that? And what does it look like? And how is that, you know, um, explained and unfolded? Well, that's an entirely different context than what's been, you know, taught and promoted for the past, say, you know, 40 years at this point. Yeah. So let's, let's, and Alex, maybe you can jump in here. When we have traditionally heard someone is quote apostolic, we usually say something like, well, the function of what they're doing is say more missionary, like they're planting churches, they're, um, they're, they're in a, in a level of authority where they're over multiple congregations or multiple churches. But in the historic community, uh, when we say we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, what are we talking about? That's for you, Alex. For me. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry. So, um, it's been passed down, you know, from the very beginning from the apostles. Um, I just finished up, well, I'm almost finished up my uh, first semester in seminary. So, bear with me. I, uh, I'm taking church history, and, uh, you know, it starts, the church history one, it, it starts with the apostles, with Jesus and the apostles, you know, that's, that's the history of the church, and Jesus passed on these, these gifts and these promises and the church, you know, through the disciples and through the apostles, and that's, that's kind of what I think when, you, when we're talking about holy, one holy apostolic church, that it's been passed down from the apostles. And then those apostles spread those out to other bishops and priests and clergy of other cities. And that's, it's exponentially grown from that. And that's, to me, that's what I think it means to be holy, one holy apostolic church. So I'm going to, Alex just threw a lob out there, Pastor Darrell. I'm going to, I'm going to swing at it. What he talked okay. about was, he talked about authority there. He talked about more than just function because functionally, if we're planting churches, if we're networking and creating these, these, uh, these, we would call them, you know, uh, in more vernacular terms, we, we, we might call them large groupings or, or gatherings of churches together. Fine. But, but Alex threw out a lob there because he, he put out the word authority. He said, apostles then gave it to somebody else. And then they gave it to bishops and those bishops gave it to priests as though there was authority to do that. And that's kind of where I'm going with this idea of the, of the apostle is that it's more than just function because we're all agreeing that there's a level of function here that, that we can identify. But when we're saying authority of one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we're, we're talking something bigger than you and I. We're talking about something yeah. that transcends us. Well, so I think we can, we, we'll, we'll go back to, to them, to, to uh, the apostles and their immediate trainees um, in a moment. Most of the time today in charismatic circles specifically, when you hear someone talking about an apostle, um, often, and this is why I was throwing out all the confusion a, a few minutes ago, often what's been happening is that there's a group, there's a movement called the New Apostolic Reformation, which has grown in its influence in the past 15 or 20 years, in which everybody who is a leader in it becomes an apostle. Right, and they all get prophesied over that they're an apostle, and all of that is is stemming. And I'll put it this: I'll give you an example. I was in a meeting 17, 18 years ago, and they had this this guy come in, um, and they told me that I, the group that invited me to the meeting, he was an apostle from a particular place in uh, South Africa. And I was like, really, apostle? Okay. He says, Oh yeah, you're gonna love it. You got to come listen to him. You got you got to come be part of what's going on. I said, Okay. So I go to this meeting and I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this, this, this guy, nice guy, real nice guy. Um, wonderful testimony, you know, stories of his ministry, this kind of thing. Um, but as I sat there listening to what he was saying, I realized, wait a second, this guy is an overseer. Like in the language I was used to, he, he's like an overseer. And here he is giving these pastors tidbits of advice and counsel and, and things that they should do. And, and, and uh, you know, how they can conduct their ministries for maximum impact and all that kind of stuff. Um, I thought, what is, what is going on there? So that, that's one example. You've got another side of this is that, that in the New Apostolic Reformation specifically, um, which is connected to the story I just shared, you get a lot of independent churches out there, a lot of congregational churches that don't have any outside jurisdiction or authority because they've been taught 
since the rise of that particular brand of church life that uh, they come out of a, a cessationist, many of them, context that says there's no spiritual gifts. And there's uh, like there's or no extraordinary gifts of the spirit, I should say. Well, apostleship as a, as a as someone who has authority over churches and has spiritual power to do certain things and certain gifts. This, I mean, there's nuances here. That's why it's hard to nail it down. They say all that ceased. It all stopped with the Apostle John. Well, it only takes so long to live without oversight of a congregation that you start to see the effects of the lack of that oversight because the church starts to, to all kinds of stuff starts happening. Now, it can happen with oversight, but that's kind of not where we're going right now. That new apostolic reformation is basically creating its own superstructures where the people that are a part of it are claiming to be apostles. And you can't say like the 12 because some do and some don't. You can't say like Paul, some do and some don't. There's really no, like, how do you put your fingers on it other than they call themselves the new apostolic reformation and they are the ones that are going to bring in the kingdom. Um, but even then, some of them would not would say no to that. That's one aspect of this, the way the apostolic is used. Um, another is it's used by mission, uh, by denominations. We use it for their missionaries, their mm -hmm. church planters, for the people that are going out and doing, quote, apostolic works, whether it's pioneering um, in, in places where the gospel has not been preached at all, or it's just in, in new evangelistic endeavors by people who have a good administrative quality and can raise up other people behind them. All of that is typically churches outside of, quote, the apostolic succession. And I think that's where you were going a little bit ago. That's how they tend to use the phrase, because the apostolic succession is typically understood to be something that refers to the preaching of the gospel and not to a, an organizational continuity within the church. Yeah, well, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm stressing here, though, and, and this is where, again, going back to Alex's idea here, is... Does anybody have, we're not saying anybody's an apostle like the 12 or even Paul for this case. That for sure is no one's rewriting scripture. No one's an eyewitness in the way those men were. But um, what's well, being described in function today, I'm trying to drive home the question, does anybody have the authority to pass down what the apostles were doing in a way that says, hey, look, we're sanctioned by Jesus to oh, do this the bishop. Yeah. Well, specifically at the College of Bishops. So uh, think of like the, the word police, police. You say it's the police and you can either be uh, singular or plural, depending on what part of the country you're from, right? So you've got, because you've got this idea that uh, there's one body of law in a nation and then you have the people that enforce those laws. It's kind of part of what's going on. That's a little bit of an illustration there. So in the in the context of the church, there's, there's one God, there's one Christ, you know, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So there's one episcopacy, there's one college of bishops. So in Matthew 16, 18, when Jesus says to Simon, says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, Simon Barjona, um, you know, he, he conveys to him the keys. So I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatsoever you shall bind, shall be bound, whatever you loose, shall be loosed. Jesus uses the same phrase again in 1818, so two chapters later, and in that passage, he's speaking to the, to the, to the whole group of them, and so you have the, 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 the apostles, the 12, become this, what we would call a college, so there's one apostolate, there's one office of apostleship, one, one ministry, because there's only one church. How many priesthoods existed in Israel? Just one. Just now, there's yeah. their hierarchy in that priesthood, but there's just one. So uh, the priesthood of Christ is the priesthood of Melchizedek. He's, he, he's a, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, the psalmist says, in which Hebrews reiterates. So when Jesus breathes upon the apostles at Easter and says, receive the Holy Spirit, that's their ordination. And he's, he says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. So he breathes on them the Holy Spirit then as those sent, as, uh, as Sheliak, apostolos, his immediate direct representatives. When you get into the book of Acts, the, the church is expanding, so they, they select, they have the church nominate, put forward some individuals, and then they take those individuals and they lay hands upon them, 
and the spirit that is upon them that they received when Jesus breathed upon them, they are conferring a measure of the spirit, of that authority, on those to help them in the ministry. The word ministry is letargio, and, and um, where we get the word deacon, uh, service, diaconos. So you've got this ministry of service, and you've got this ministry of worship, and the interplay of these two things in the New Testament, which if you go back and you read the Greek Old Testament in reference to the law, when they translate to Hebrew, Hebrew into the Greek, you read about the, the way they worshiped in the tabernacle and in the temple, and all of that is being fulfilled by Christ and now conveyed to the apostles for the worship and practice of the church. You go forward into the book of Acts, and you see now that the apostles are specifically raising up others, um, in the same, and, and the implication is they're doing it in the same way they do in chapter 6. So by the time you get to the end of the, the writings of the New Testament, you have the apostles, the 12, and then others who are kind of numbered along with them eventually, like Paul and Barnabas and Timothy, Titus, Silas. Um, they, they become bishops. They're overseeing the work, and they're raising up elders who are patterned after the elders of the Old, Old Testament who weren't Levites, but they had authority and rulership in the churches. Um, and this was the synagogue practice all amongst the empire anyway. Uh, the Zechonim is what they were called. Uh, they were the elders, the rulers um, of synagogues and this kind of thing. So that they go in and they preach. They raise up these elders. They lay hands upon them. They confer authority upon them. And they do the same thing with deacons. And so you've got this the hierarchy of, of bishop, uh, presbyter, or priest, and deacon. But all of that is the, con is the continuity of one apostolic ministry. And that one apostolic ministry is going out with that commission from John 20 and in the other parts where Jesus gives a great commission to the apostles to baptize and to disciple and, and to do all these things and to forgive and not to forgive sins, to use the reference in John 20, which is all priestly language. And you see Paul doing this clearly in, to the Corinthians. Uh, John is writing about it in 3 John. Uh, Peter's doing this in Acts 8. Um, so we see this in the language of the scripture. So when someone says that the, the office of apostle is being restored, usually the people that are claiming that are coming are saying that outside of the historic tradition because you know those that are coming from the historic tradition would acknowledge it, it never left. It's, it's, it's gotten dim, it's gotten dirty, it's gotten clouded, cloudy. It's, it's had to be revived, like it's had to be a, a quickening, a strengthening, a cleaning off, a, a reformation and renewal and restore. You've got all that stuff. But to say that it, it, it died and it's gone, and now the Holy Spirit's got to bring it all back because the church has been wrong, that's the height of hubris. Um, but as I said at the outset, the phrase, the term apostle, is used by so many different denominations to mean so many different things. In some places, it just means overseer. Like, they use it interchangeably. This person is apostle of such and such group, meaning they're an overseer that execute all the responsibilities that, that are involved with that. And then you have others who would, you know, make it a very, um, like it's, it's, it's a title of, of, of uh, what they think their spiritual function is. Uh, so there's, there's all kinds of variety in it. But if we're going to stick with, a, I think, a more biblical approach that was then understood by the fathers and the consensus of the church Catholic, the apostolic ministry is the, is the bishop, and then how the bishop is part of the college of bishops, right? Because Jesus gives authority to Peter, but then to the others. So they, they are the apostles. They are this, this group that has this authority, and then they share and they convey and appoint out through history. So that the bishop, so put it this way, priests, presbyters, are priests, and deacons are deacons because their authority is derived from their particular bishop. And that particular bishop doesn't exist independent of the rest of the bishops in the world or in history. He is interdependent because it's a college of bishops that they're, they're working together. So that even if you get a bishop that goes into error, well, he, that doesn't negate the others because Judas's sin didn't negate the others. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is what I'm trying to, to bring. We can honor function without calling it what historically the church has always called it, which is the seat of the bishop or the place of the bishop, carrying on the work of the apostolic. Because you're right. If we look at all these different scenarios in which 
someone is using it as overseer or a title of honor or a title of respect and then all these different functions. Um, we're, we're here to look at this historically to say, well, what has the church always called that position? And what has the church always conveyed it to be? And when Alex had said the um, one holy Catholic and apostolic church starting with the 12 and then it's getting passed down, um, we want to look at that. And we want to take that seriously because when we're saying it's getting restored or recovered, um, I think people mean well, but I think they're seeing them absent from the rest of the body of Christ. And I want to open that conversation up to say, no, historically, uh, from Orthodox or Anglican or Roman Catholic, and then even from a functional level, Methodists and Baptists, um, we are all operating under this uh, premise that we are the body of Christ. So if we are the body of Christ, we have to look at the collective history. And the collective history says that seat was given to the bishop. And... Um, I want to be able to honor that at the same time. I want to be able to ask those brothers and sisters in those certain denominations. Um, if it's being restored, then it, it was lost or it was gone. And, and I, I, we really have to ask that as a serious question. Is that a true claim? And I, 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 I want to challenge that to say, well, do, do some homework. Let's look. Is that a true claim that that office of apostle had disappeared or it was gone or it was, I don't know, whatever the wording may be. I think you've got a couple of uh, snapshots even in the New Testament. So for example, when um, Paul is, is called, he, Paul's, I love Paul. When you read him in Galatians 1, he is as emphatic as you can imagine about how his call into the apostolic work he had wasn't from men and people basically had nothing to do with it. And then he, and then you go on later into the into the, his letter to the Galatians, and he's he is vitriol. I mean, he is he's intensely writing against circumcision. When you read the book of Acts, Paul is commissioned into his apostolic call by the church in Antioch, and then in another account in Acts, he has Timothy circumcised. Paul, what are you doing? So it doesn't mean those things aren't contradictory. They're complementary pictures of one guy. So we read them together, right? So and I bring it up, I bring that up because in Galatians in one, Paul is super emphatic about his his ministry not being inferior to Peter or any of the others. That's, that's really what he's emphasizing. He's emphasizing that a lot there at the outset. But he says in chapter two that it was by revelation he went and submitted his gospel to those who seemed to be pillars, and how they gave him the right hand of fellowship. I think anybody that the Holy Spirit is calling and raises up outside, if we want, if we want to dismiss. Uh, the Acts narrative for a second, which realistically you can't do, but we're trying to illustrate something here. If the Holy Spirit raises up somebody outside of the church and he's poured out upon them apostolic charism, the grace, prophetic charism, he's doing that. He's not going to send them rogue. At some point, they come, they're, they're, they have to connect because the Lord is not, he's not for splitting the church into visible pieces. That's, we just don't see that in the, in the history of scripture. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, when God begins the process of splitting off the northern tribes from the southern tribes, it's because of the sin in the southern tribes. It's because, because of Solomon's sin in his latter years that God raises up Rehoboam and has him split them off. And one of the scariest passages in the Old Testament is when we read about Jeroboam setting up the, the calves for worship at Dan and um, Bethel, and how he in, raises up his own priesthood, his own sacrifices, his own own everything, and he calls it the Lord. I mean, this is that's a, that should that should cause all of us to pause in our tracks and say, "Oh Lord, am I a priest at one of those shrines for that calf?" And I don't know it. You know, am I? A, you know, but having said that. Two of the greatest prophets in Israel, Israelite history were Elijah and Elisha. And the bulk of their ministry that we read about happened in those northern tribes. So, the Apocrypha. I know that people have mixed feelings about that. But the book of Tobit is all about a man who lived amongst the northern tribes and continued to go down to Jerusalem for the sacrifices in the temple before he got ran into his problems. So, when, you, when you're looking at this from the New Testament perspective, 
if, if the Holy Spirit's going to raise up somebody into an apostolic office, he's going to raise them up into any kind of office. He's not going to uh, jettison them out into becoming their own institution that exists in, in, in co- to, to be in contrast, to be, to be at odds with the church he's already established. He's not inconsistent like this. He, he doesn't, he's, not, uh, he's not divided. His mind isn't split. Our minds are but the spirit's minds are not. His mind is not. Christ's mind is not. So, you know, this is, this, and this speaks to, we could, without going a whole lot into the Reformation itself, those early reformers weren't trying to create new denominations Absolutely. and new churches. Absolutely. They were trying to clean off all the excess and, uh, uh, that had developed. It's only been in, in recent American history, really, that you see this proliferation of groupings with the, the claim that I'm an apostle or I'm a prophet or whatever the title they want to use is, and I've been led by the Holy Spirit to create this entirely new and distinct organization. I, and, I, and I do challenge anybody, read Martin Luther in particular, his first three years, especially when he's running and he's having to hide, read his letters to the Pope. I, I encourage you to read what he wrote and in, in, in his desire to bring reformation within the current Christian structure called the Catholic Church. Um, It's evident. I don't want to labor too hard on this. My point in understanding is that when we when we when we make a term um, uh, in in honoring function, we have to be careful that we're not replacing what has always been and confusing people into what has always been. So my challenge to you is to be able to look back in church history in particular and scripturally and ask: Should we be using that word apostle? Should we be using that phrase as it's been historically known, biblically known, and um, in current context, uh, is it bringing any levels of confusion or any levels of frustration while we're still honoring the grace and gift that is in people's lives? Um, and I think we can do that. I, think, I mean, I think we, I don't know who would not want to affirm, you know, uh, to use the four or fivefold ministry, depending upon how you want to break down pastors and teachers, but I think all of that in, in there in Ephesians 4 are things that everybody wants to see. Um, I personally don't have a problem with somebody using the title apostle, as long as we know what in the world we're talking about. Um, that, I think, is the problem, especially when you get out into other um, contexts. You know, I mean, I, I, I obviously, I, we would do better to, to speak more about uh, what's common because then we can build more commonality. Yes. Alex, so I'm going to transition into this idea of gifts because we don't have time to really do a whole, you know, amounts episode when someone calls himself a prophet, teacher, pastor, evangelist. Uh, We're just starting the can of worms. You know, in your study of church history so far, let me ask you, is it a fair claim to say that in the 1900s, primarily that the gifts were restored there? Uh, or, or has it been that the church has been in an ebb and flow of, of the practice of the gifts and the acceptance of the gifts? I think it's been, you know, an ebb and flow. You know, there's been waves of it. You know, there's God's going to move where God's going to move. I mean, we see that all throughout history. You know, we see that in the Bible. It's a, it's, I, I, wrote, I wrote about that in the paper last night. We see the cyclical flow of, of the Israelites. You know, they, they, they're, they serve God and they're doing great and everything's going well, but then something happens and they start complaining and they start grumbling and they start setting up idols and they start doing stuff that's wrong, you know, and then God sends somebody to attack them or, or something bad happens or something. And then they, they start crying out to God again and, and God moves again. And we see that all throughout scripture. And we've seen that all throughout time that uh, there's, there are movements. God is moving. I mean, we see it in the great awakenings, uh, all the great awakenings of the world, you know, and we see that that God is moving in in different places in the world, you know. Here in the United States, you know, maybe it was dry, maybe it was dead, yeah. But you know, we see with um, with the the later like the latter rain revivals and uh, different uh, the stone revivals and and we see you know the big Azusa Street revival. We see all those, and we see revivals in the '90s, you know, with the um, Brownsville revivals. We see revivals. And in our recorded history, I mean, most history is recorded, but like in this really recorded history where people that are still alive are really experiencing that. So we're seeing God move and people are thinking that it's something new, 
but God's always moved since the very beginning, since he created Adam and Eve, God's been moving on his creation and he, and he moves on our hearts. And, and yeah, I don't, I don't, I think there's times where, you know, where God's not moving, you know, because we're in sin or we're doing something wrong. And yes, we absolutely need restoration. Yes. There's, there's times where God is pouring fresh anointing, but it's not new. It's never been new since the very beginning. It's not been new. Which yeah, and so it takes us into that era of revivalism. Go ahead and develop that revival, revivalism, you know. Right. So here's what I, I want to lay out with this. When you hear a person saying phrases, and to be honest, I, I want to admit that there has been times when I've used these phrases in my excitement. I have said things like, this is the cutting edge of what God is doing, or this is um this is, this is how God's about to move or projecting it to be uh, something on the newer side. Here's what I want to say particularly about the gifts. As a student of the scripture, which I hope all of you are, and as a student of church history, I, hope, I, I really want to challenge you to begin to look back. We stopped at John Wesley in the last episode. Um, I, I really want to begin to encourage you to look um, in, in, in really the, 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 tw- the 200s all the way up to the 13 and 1400s. Look at the writings of these men and these women. You had mystics. You had individuals operating in spiritual gifts um, that there is no way you can walk away saying in church history that the gifts stopped after the first century, nor can we say that they just came about in the 19th century. And here's what I want to lob out to you guys. Two things happen when we say that this is the new cutting edge or this is the uh, thing God is doing now as though it's being restored. The new thing. Yes, we run the risk of at best things starting over in a beginning form, meaning when you get a new tool or a new uh, toy, new shiny thing, uh, you know, for most of us, it's gadgets, it's electronic gadgets. It takes us a while to learn those systems and those buttons and those gizmos and we make a lot of mistakes in the beginning and so we have to learn um, how to do it from scratch and at worst what ends up happening is we break the gadget or the gizmo or we hurt people in the process when we're saying that the gifts are being restored now what we're doing is cutting off the thousand plus years that the church has had to learn through trial and error through correction through revelation that this is how the proper way to use this gadget or gasmo is. And please forgive me, Holy Spirit. I'm not saying your gifts or gizzards or gasmos. But, um, and then at worst, what happens is we end up hurting people uh, with, that, with that gift. When God, I think, collectively would say, looking at scripture and looking at I, what we have done, here's how you can use this in a healthy, holistic way to edify the church and use it as a gift of evangelism. So I want to lob it out to you guys. Um, have you seen this? Have you seen that when we use that phrase or we use that language or that rhetoric, that some of these dangers come into play? I, I see, I see two nods, (laughs) an uncomfortable chuckle. You know, yeah. Every, every generation has its own particular arrogance. Um, and our modern, mo- our contemporary generation's arrogance um, significant. You know, what was going on? What is it about the 1960s to the 1990s that told that generation of people, you know, the um, here in America, right? The uh, the boomers and the extras as they were coming of age, which would be us, Mike. <laughs> um, Old, yes. Uh, that God all of a sudden had decided to reveal and unveil so many new truths and so many new practices. I mean, I want you to think about this. Lex orandi, lex credendi. Lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer is the law of belief. What we believe is what we pray. This has been a, a maxim for the church Catholic since forever, right? I mean, it goes back to Exodus, goes back to Leviticus, goes back to the law. 
here lies with a massive variety of liturgical practice. And I know people are going to say, well, you know, we don't have a liturgy. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. It's probably uh, a, a high powered greeting. Well, first you got the, the five minute countdown, the three minute countdown on the screen. Then you get a high powered greeting. Hey, everybody, thank you for being here this morning. So good to see you. Jesus loves that you're here today. That kind of thing. Then you get three songs, three to five, depending upon the particular church. Two thirds of them are rock, high powered, guitar screaming. I love that. I mean, I like Striper too, right? Like Bon Jovi. That, that's, what, that's what's happening. Then it cools down. I mean, you, you hit your cruising altitude, the, the music slows down. Now the spirit's starting to move. The hands are slowly going up into the air and coming down. Then you get somebody, you know, it doesn't have to be the senior pastor. He's over there and he's, he's ripped jeans. You get somebody else that comes over. He's, he's the assistant pastor learning now how to move in the spirit. And he comes over and he starts praying and he prays with, with intensity. If he's brand new, he kind of stumbles and says, Lord Jesus Christ, about five times too much. And then, then we get a sermon, 17 to 21 minutes, about me becoming self-actualized. God reigns in heaven for me. Jesus died for me. Jesus went to hell for me. Jesus rose from the dead for me. Jesus wants me to command the angels to go get my harvest. Jesus wants me to be rich. He wants me to be skinny but fat at the same time. Jesus wants all this for me. And then, then after, after that's done, we are invited to raise our hands to say that we believe in that Jesus. And the music's flow sounds more like Elton John at this point. Because if the music is softer, we're going to get more of a response and people are going to come down and give their lives to whatever spiritual power they're calling Jesus. Now, I know that sounds hard. and That sounds like a bite. But I'm going to tell you right now, that's been going on for so long in the American evangelical context. People don't know the gospel anymore when they hear it. John the Baptist began this way. Jesus began this way. And the apostles and the evangelists began this way. Repent and believe the gospel for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We all like good music. We all like good programs. But let's not pretend that that's not a liturgy. It very clearly is a liturgy. And then we could go to the other side with people who are so uber meticulous in their liturgy that they don't have actually any living faith anymore. They they've have their own supplantation going on where, you know, they can have the smells and the bells and the long robes and the hands raised, but they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in the virgin birth. They confess the creed with their fingers crossed. All that to say, all of these wildly divergent liturgical practices seem to indicate to me that there's multiple gods that are being worshipped with the same name by people. And that's why I go back to that, that story from the Old Testament with Jehoshaphat. So, does it do damage? I think so. I think so. I think he's froze, Alex. Maybe he's asleep. <laughs> That's funny. So, well, yeah, go ahead, man. While he's trying to figure out what's wrong with this signal. <laughs> I just think uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, where we're putting ourselves in place, really. You know, we're, we're right there with Jesus. Like, we're on the same playing field. And I think that's kind of a, a danger, you know, where, where we're doing that. Like, you know, Jesus' kingdom is here. It's at hand, like you said, it's it's at hand. And there's gotta be a time where we, you know, realize that he's on the throne and that's where we gotta be. Did you wake up from your nap? I did. It was a good time. <laughs> Becoming a tradition for me to get booted off at least once per episode. <laughs> so, uh, Pastor Darrell, <laughs> you you were able to really create uh a lot there. I, I hope I, I hope you know we're going to get a lot of a lot of responses from that. Uh, we might. Here, here's what I want to lay out. As you're talking about these liturgies, and you're talking about these structures, the reality is we're calling people back to the wisdom of what was, and what can be now. And when we're talking in regards to these spiritual gifts, Alex, forgive me, I don't know what you just said in that, in that last uh, last portion there. Um, but when we're talking about the reality of these spiritual gifts, my friends, the church has always been operating in these gifts. It has never stopped. There has been times where, it, and, and I really appreciated how, Alex, when you said before, things have gotten ugly, 
at times. And, you know, it's been brought up that it's been cloudy, dusty, and dirty. Um, yes, that has been the case. But my friends, we've, we've got an opportunity to walk in maturity. I mean, think about that. The gifts that we are, are saying as charismatic and Pentecostals, which I am, we have the ability to walk in maturity on these gifts because others have gone before us. Men and women have practiced these things, and we've got an opportunity to draw from that very, very deep well. And I don't want to cut that off by saying it's a new thing, and I now have to figure it all out. I don't want to cut that now, off. You, you've gotten in the era of Charlemagne, one of the first reformations in Christian practice, Carolingian Renaissance. Charlemagne required every church to have a copy of the Bible. Henry VIII and Edward VI, that was not the first time in Christian history churches were required to have Bibles. And that in those days, it was the Vulgate, obviously, because that's what that was the majority language that they, right? But you've got that Carolingian Renaissance, and, and then you've uh, Reformation. And you've the Reformation, let's use the one from the 1500s um, that people are more familiar with today. One of the battle cries that they had was ad fontes, ad fontes, back to the fount, back to the sources. What was, what's first? What, what, what is that first? And that's why the scripture and the doctrine that scripture is the authority, scripture alone is the final authority, doesn't negate other authorities. It doesn't, it doesn't negate other things that are true. It says that, you know, the scripture is the ultimate truth revealed by God that's written. When we're talking about the restoration of gifts and particular charisms and operations of the Holy Spirit, one of the things that you want to ask yourself is how often is the Holy Spirit permitted to contradict himself? When is he allowed to change his mind? <laughs> At what point in the history of the church did he say, you know what, I know I've been telling you that's what this means for 1,200 years, but I'm going to say it means this now. And we're not talking about, there's a, there's a big difference between contradiction and development. And I'm not a big proponent of development per se, but just to kind of, because that could, that could opens up a whole nother can of worms. But there's, there, are, there are times in the history of the church when more clarification of a mystery is needed, but it needs to be done in such a way that you're still preserving the mystery. Because if you overdefine it, you, you've gone into a different era. But there's times in history when certain clarifications, and because it's a clarification, it needs to be articulated and it has to be articulated precisely, that has to happen. Case in point, it's the Council of Nicaea, and then again, the Council of Constantinople, so we get the Nicene-Constantinople Creed. Oh, the Creed of Nicaea, right? Nicene Creed. There are pockets of time like that in Christian history, but that's never a contradiction of what was before it, and it's never a deviation of the practice that was before it. It's a, it's a shoring up to reemphasize particularities that have to be articulate. That have to be presented to the people. We're living in a day right now when there are so, so many Christians, whether they're part of a historic tradition or they're part of a denomination that started 35 years ago in somebody's basement in Southern California. We've got so much going on that we really need to have a resurgence of this ad fontes. We need to go back to the Scripture, and then we need to go back after we say, "Well, I've got the Bible." Are you reading the ecclesiastical books? Are you working through the creeds? Are you living according to the faith that was once for all delivered to the church and has it been understood by the church Catholic in her undivided history? Can you do that? And we, we're gonna, that's going to have to happen. If we don't have that happen, um, we're going to watch the obliteration of even more than what we've seen. And let me just, let me, the obliteration doesn't mean it's going to cease to exist. It means it's going to continue to be these shivers and slivers of piece of parts of, of, of a gospel and not the entirety of it. And I, if there's ever a time for ad fontes, it's right now. And I just, you know, I want to add a little comment to that. Um, with all these councils, there was usually a differing idea, and that's why they were having these. And the people that had the differing idea, they were considered heretics. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's... <laughs> Once the decision was made, the church had made it. Yeah. That, that's a, so uh, you mentioned Luther. You know, Luther didn't say the councils don't have any important value to them. Right. Right. You, you, if you read William Law, if you read uh, who's uh, the Anglican archbishop uh, was martyred, was killed, you go back and you read Hooker, another Anglican theologian, go back and read um, uh, John Jewell. Go back and read these people 
part of that Reformation era, they're very clear. The church has authority. And when the church makes a decision, you submit to that authority because that's what the Bible teaches. If the, if the church is wrong and the, and the, and the decree of the, of the council is wrong, the Holy Spirit will amend it in due time through another council. Like this is the process in the church, right? This lone ranger, I'm going to do what God told me. He, he just, uh-uh. Story, there's a story from one of the monks, the Desert Fathers. Uh, the guy had lived, I think, 35, 40 years in his cell alone. He wouldn't even come out and celebrate with the other Christian, the other monks for the high holy days, events and stuff, because he was going to keep to his discipline and he was going to keep fasting as, as he was told by God to do. Well, when he got old, he went out and he found a well and he jumped down into the well and fell down and was basically, I don't remember if he died or not, but it was such a bad thing, you know, and then when they asked him why he did it, because God told him. No, he didn't. You lived in such a, and the, and the reason they preserved the story amongst the Desert Fathers was to say is, you cut yourself off from the body to such an extent, and you gave yourself over to a deluding spirit that destroyed you. The scripture says, you submit to the church, you obey the church. If the church is wrong, God will correct it, because that's, that's one of the principles of the Reformation, is the church is going to make mistakes, but the church isn't going to stay in that mistake. Now, Rome has, has allocated that authority principally to the Pope, but the Protestant claim, early Protestant claim, the claim amongst the Orthodox is that, the Orthodox East, is that, no, the Holy Spirit's going to lead the church. He's going to keep us. He's going to shape us. He's going to direct us. Once the church has made a decision, it, and it's, 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 it's established, there's no other council that can undo that. At least there shouldn't be, especially if it's a clarification of Scripture. Canon law is a different matter, but when it, we're talking about the, the, the decisions of councils, those kinds of things, uh, you know, Luther, these guys, there's, uh, John Jewell, I mentioned them, Hooker, they're all emphatic about this. We don't have that power. And in the, the 39 articles, the church doesn't have the authority to command anything contrary to Scripture. We can't do it. If scripture says don't do it, there's no power to do it. And that's not because the 39 articles have power in and of themselves, but because it's a summation of the teaching of scripture and the consensus of the first several centuries of Christian practice. They can be amended, you know, as, as anything can, but not the scripture. And that's, that's the, that's. Yeah, and I I wanna I wanna wrap up here as we're coming close to our uh, the end of our of our time, and I want to do it this way, and I want to end it more on a pastoral note, you know, in particular something that the three of us have seen is is in the misuse and abuse of some of the giftings and then the separation of them to a more exclusive. It's happening new. It's happening now, and we've all experienced some of these more. Uh, I don't want to say infantile, but you know, the, the newness of the gift, having to learn it um, just pastorally, let me say this. We're going to, we're going to cover two of these particular areas. One about speaking in tongues and one about hearing from God. Um, number one, we have all in the Pentecostal movement in particular, uh, and, we, and we covered this in a previous episode, but I want to deal with it pastorally. We have uh, number one, tongues was not given in the 1900s uh, for the first time since the book of Acts. Um, that is simply not true. And uh, we'll go back and read the liturgies in particular that set up a time for the anointing of the oil and the belief that God was going to give the spirit to those who had the bishop lay hands on them. And then read in history what happened when bishop laid hands on people. Read the stories um, and, and do searchings on, on the gift of tongues in church history. And I, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be surprised. But this is what I want to say. I'm not a pastor but I am a brother in Christ. And what I want to first do is apologize. If you've ever heard anybody teach the error that unless you're baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, then you're not a Christian or you're a lesser than Christian or you're somehow inferior, I'm going to apologize to you right now. That is ridiculous. That is infantile thinking from well-meaning people. And again, when I mean infantile, it's just young, it's not been developed over 2,000 years type thinking. Um, and, and secondly, and, and I want to open this up to the floor and just to give it like, you know, five minutes or so. If you are hearing things from God, and it's been brought up now, a couple of things uh, here. Alex mentioned it by, by way of church council, and, and Pastor Darrell talked about it with the Desert Fathers. 
in the prophetic movement, there is some sort of teaching out there that says if you hear something from God and you don't act on it immediately, that you're in compromise, um, that you're somehow not obeying God. Now, listen, I'm not saying clear, main and plain scripture stuff, okay? If you're hearing from God and the Holy Spirit is telling you to stop sinning and you can read it clearly in scripture, then do it immediately. But I'm talking about things that people are, go take this job, move over here, or do that. If you are feeling the sense of condemnation because you want to submit it to other people and you want to take time to test that word, my friend, hear me clearly. Hearing from God is a community activity and you should be submitting it to people in your life, authority figures, friends, family. And the way the practice of the church has set this up is it is not to control you. Councils were not meant in some evil manipulative way that some stuffy religious guys want to control the thinking of the church it was for the safety and the well-being of the flock of god that these men did this so i want to encourage you that if you're hearing from god on anything take time to test it you're not being anti-revival or anti-religious or compromising take time to test it submit it to people Pray about it. Take time. Share it with your priest. Share it with your pastor. You are going to be following scripture and the church tradition. Guys, go ahead and jump in. I'll just say something quick. I, um, you know, I, you know, I got filled with the Holy Spirit uh, when I was 11, and I've really, you know, I've since then, you know, I'm 30 now, and I, I've I've felt the Lord speak to me a lot of times about a lot of things. You know, I've really. I've really been careful to try to listen and to do what the Lord wanted me to do. And I know that there's been times even recently where I've had to make huge decisions in my life, uprooting decisions, life changing decisions. And I've known in my life that the Lord is speaking to me differently at different times in my life. So that's something that I've always struggled with. Because most of the time, you know, when I feel the Lord speaking to me, I'll have, you know, a gut feeling, you know, I'll just, I'll just know, you know, and I'm just like, well, that's what I got to do. But there's been times where it's been, like I said, these life altering decisions that I have to make. And, you know, you know, I've shared something with you recently, Mike, and, you know, I've shared a lot with, with you, with Father Darrow, just submitting those to you guys so you guys can pray with me. And so the Lord can speak to you guys and that are in leadership over me. So I can make a wise, biblical, spiritual decision without just being out here on my own. Because sometimes, you know, my mind, I can make up things, you know. I mean, I could, you know, I could be releasing a lot of serotonin one day or a lot of other chemicals in my brain one day, you know. So sure. we get these great ideas and we run with them sometimes. But, you know, Father Darrell always says the church isn't in a hurry, you know. If you're being blatant disobedient, okay. But if you, you know, but there's times we just put, pump the brakes a little bit and just say, Lord, you know, please speak to me and please clarify this, you know? So the practice of the church has been to discern corporately and, and to discern one to another in love and in, in, in um, the spirit of, of grace. Okay. So we're going to be wrapping things up here. Um, once again, we want to pray for you. We love you. We care for you. And Mike, let me, let, me, let me stop you before you close it and say this. We believe in the gifts and the power of the Spirit. Amen. We want to affirm that. I want to affirm that. And, and that people should pray and get close to and draw near to the Lord personally, but not individually. And that's, that's the danger. So as you, as you draw near to the Lord personally with like-minded people in your church, with the church, as part of the church, Expect him to speak, expect him to strengthen you, expect him to fill you, and he's going to quicken gifts in you. And one of the ways you know that it's him is because it's consistent with what he's done in history. And I think that's kind of where we were hitting at this morning, yeah. is the, or this afternoon, by saying it's new, you, you don't know what you're saying. You think you're saying something, but it, it, theologically, it's a different perspective. You want to stay in continuity with the Holy Spirit's been doing and walk in that blessing. Yeah. Yeah. And we said before, if you're hearing something new, then you should be scared because the likelihood is that in the collective mind of God over 2000 years, 
at least of Christian history, much less the elect of God going all the way back to the beginning of time, it's been thought of. And, and God has practiced it and, and done it. And there's, there's lots of wisdom and grace to draw from. So again, I know people mean well when they say this is the new thing God is doing or this is the restoration again, because they're noticing that function. But again, we run the danger of cutting ourselves off from the blessing of interlinking chains that are keeping things very strong. And we don't want to go that route. Guys, we're going we're gonna to cover this in future episodes of what happens when people separate from that interlinking chain. It it's, usually doesn't end well, to say the least, doesn't end well. So, Pastor Daryl, we've laid out a lot today. Uh, would you pray for us that, number one, sure. that, that people would be filled with the Holy Spirit and they would be operating in the gifts? Because Paul tells us to seek the spiritual gifts. St. Paul is very clear on that one for the building up of the church. But secondly, we can do it in maturity and wisdom, not only scripturally, but in line with, with tradition. Yeah. Lord Jesus, thank you that you promised the promise of the Father that you would send the spirit and he would clothe us with power so that we could be witnesses and share your good news with the world around us, that you would not leave us as orphans, but the spirit would come to be with us and be within us. So Lord, we ask for a, a, a fresh grace, a manifest presence of your Holy Spirit to be upon your people, to equip, to fill, to empower, to baptize, to convict, to strengthen, and to bless. Lead us, O oh Lord, and come, Holy Spirit, yes. in Jesus' name. Amen.